Um, thank you guys all for coming here. Uh, bright and early first talk of the day, track three, rocking it. Um, this is our first speaker, Jonathan. Uh, he is going to be uh, presenting an introduction to the Witchcraft Compiler Collection. Um, I hope you guys really enjoy it. And uh, I'll let him take it away. Thank you, Bello. Good morning, DEFCON. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here with you. We're going to talk about uh, some badass reverse engineering, hopefully. Um, as you saw, we got some technical problems, but uh, hopefully, with a bit of imagination, we managed to see everything. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Brossard. I have a, a whole lot of uh, content to share with you today. So I'm going to start with the boring things a little bit, and uh, hopefully we'll switch very, very quickly to uh, full demo stuff. Um, I cannot give like you know the full feedback. Uh, I mean the full prerequisites and and go through um, why everything works. So I'm going to stick to the demos and try to outline like why the you know the things which are a little bit little bit touchy work. Uh, but I can assume that you already know about the ELF format. Uh, you're familiar with POSIX, and basically the more uh, reverse engineering you done previously the more I think you'll be, appreciate to, um, uh, you'll be able to appreciate this talk. Okay, let's get started. So thank you very much uh, for coming this morning. I know it's uh, 10 a.m. DevTagon is starting, so you should uh, all be exhausted by now. The real motivation of this talk is to uh, share with you um, a new toolkit to do reverse engineering, which really facilitates a whole bunch of things that I thought were impossible before even trying to do it. Um, so it's published under MIT license. I'm in a dual MIT and BSD license because I'm reusing components which were um, already licensed this way. Uh, and I would very much like if you um, contributed to this witchcraft compiler collection. You don't have to be you know, very familiar with C or assembly to do this. As a matter of fact, you can write all the code you need on top of this framework using Lua, or a web programming language that stems from Lua and that we created specially for this tool, which I call Punk C. Okay, so quickly, who am I? Uh, so to, to introduce me, uh, I thought it would be good to tell you about my love relationship with DEF CON. Uh, my first talk ever was at DEF CON eight years ago. It was on um, um, BIOS vulnerabilities. Basically, we found a new class of vulnerabilities on the BIOS, which allowed us to uh, pop using a single exploit, TrueCrypt, BitLocker, McAfee endpoint, and a fair bit of um, 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 BIOS firmwares. Uh, then I've been rejected pretty consistently at DEF CON until four years ago where I gave this talk on uh, hardware backdooring. This is a, um, a talk I really liked because I did it with the people who, who engineered um, um, an open source bias called Coreboot. And the real pretext of this talk was to work with them. Uh, we did this for a conference in Paris called No Such Conference. And um, <laughs> basically, uh, they, they dropped the project and I pursued it a bit. And uh, yeah, it ended up being pretty cool. The MIT uh, technology review gave me, um, you know, g gave a review on it and said like that's a computer infection that can never be cured, even if you reflash the hard drive, uh, even if you change the hard drive or erase your bias and things like this. Incidentally, that's where my ex-teachers in engineering school stopped talking to me. Uh, the thing also got uh, featured in, you know, m more mainstream press. Uh, it got featured in Forbes, which is interesting. Uh, uh, they had pretty much the same feedback. I'd like you to pause for a second and imagine like, you know, the kind of online present this gives me. Imagine, uh, you know, I, meet, I, get, I get to meet a girl on Tinder or whatever, and she Googles me. She's like, oh, awesome, he's been on Forbes. Yeah, for writing malware, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm telling you I've been, yeah, pretty consistently rejected. That's a message to you if you submit to conferences. Being rejected is part of it. It's normal. It's completely expected. Uh, so stuff that didn't make it to uh, DEF CON, but that I presented at Black Hat. Uh, that was a, a, a pretty cool debugger, I thought. Uh, it's called PMCMA. You can find the, uh, the code base online if you're interested. Basically, the normal way it works is um, you have one debugger who's debugging a debuggy, 
and you get a one shot. If you crash the debuggy, like you have to restart everything again. So instead of doing this, my debugger was attaching to the debuggy, forcing it to fork to replicate itself in memory, and then we'd work at on one fork at a time. That's the routine you can see over there. Um, finally, last year, we did a presentation with uh, my team from Salesforce. Um, we pretty much resurrected SMB relays, and our contribution was to show that it doesn't work just on LANs, it actually works from the internet. Uh, I saw on the schedule um, this year that there were more talks on SMB at Black Hat, so uh, yeah, I hope we uh, resurrected something. If you run uh, Windows Networks, you want to, to watch this talk, because uh, this is still unpatched, and this is affecting every version of Windows. Okay, this uh, slide is brought to you by the Security Vacation Club. <laughs> what do you do once you've done all the work to um, you know, create a badass presentation and that you have massive content you'd like to share? Well, do it more than once. There's all this list of very cool conferences. Uh, so I to go some in Paris. I'm a bit biased because I created it. I came to the box in Malaysia, which is really awesome. H2HC in Brazil, it's insanely good. SciScan in Asia, uh, things like Shakacon in Hawaii, uh, I'm also part of the program committee of that one. Infiltrate in Miami, Recon in Canada, only reverse engineering, very, very cool. KiwiCon in New Zealand, Eco Party in Buenos Aires, Zero Nights in Russia. So basically, if you do all the work to create one presentation, I suggest you, you know, enjoy your security vacation club tour and give it to all those conferences. There is one left I didn't put in the slides because it's a trap. It's called RoxCon in Australia. I was supposed to go there for one week to speak, and I stayed four years, so it's a trap. <laughs> okay, a bit of disclaimer, and then let's go, let's go to the meat. Um, so my employer <laughs> does not wish to be named, even though I just did. Um, they're not associated with this talk, and this is my personal research. On the upside, it means I'm free to uh, share it with you. There's no intellectual property problem. But on the downside, it means you want to do reverse engineering and you're on your own. What do you do in this case? You call EFF to the rescue. And before anything, I'm going to ask you to give a big warm, um, um, you know, a big clap to the people of the EFF because they've been amazing. Thank you very much. I know some of them are, uh, are talking today, so they're definitely around. Uh, if you manage to catch them, like, you know, pay them a beer, because they, they're really helping us when uh, we're in situations like this where we cannot afford, like, you know, legal advising. And um, if you do reverse engineering, they have a nice fact uh, that I suggest you check. Um, the URL is on the slides. Okay, uh, so my employer doesn't want to be named, but he's recruiting. <laughs> it's a badass security team. Uh, if you saw the attacks on like breach and things like this, denonymizing SSL, uh, Ravage, which was um, a very cool tool to profile Java, or uh, the research we presented last year at, uh, at Black Hat, uh, yeah, feel free to decrypt those slides. I think we call cool. uh, the legal department and the PR department are very unlikely to decipher this slide. In terms of agenda, I'm going to talk to you quickly about why I started this project and why you know it's relevant, hopefully. And then we're going to do like some really serious black magic uh, with the Witchcraft compiler collection. I show you um, you know what are the main tools in it. I show you how to transform the shared library, like a, like uh, sorry, I'm going to show you how to transform an executable into a shared library. Okay, that, that's not supposed to fly, but that's super helpful when you do reverse engineering or exploit writing. Um, then we go further and we'll completely unlink um, an ELF to a reco relocatable file. Um, and then we'll extend that and go a bit crazy. Okay. I don't get to see my slides, so it's a bit touchy for me too. Uh, quickly, let's imagine we're working on a, an application and we don't necessarily have the source code. Honestly, even if you have it, it takes time, like, you know, to recompile things, uh, possibly to adjust your tool chain. Um, you know, you have missing dependencies and things like that. You often don't have the right headers and things. So working with source code isn't easy. I'd really like to work with binaries directly. 
As an example, um, I took a very old version of uh, SMB. It's called SMB Server 1532. It's basically a predecessor of Samba. So um, if you do static analysis, that's a pet project I run on the side uh, with another company I work with full time. So I have two full time jobs, right? The one with the company who doesn't want to be named, one with a startup in France. And I have so much free time that, you know, it allows me to uh, uh, do more research and share it with you. So basically, that's a thing we run with our startup in France. Uh, you, can, you can register for free. It's only for security researchers for the time being. It does full featured static analysis. So you upload your binary and you get back a bunch of metrics. Um, on this slide, like the more red you get, the better it is. You can see that it's checking, you know, five different aggregated metrics. Without going into the details, the bit we're gonna care about today is like, okay, you can see that the binary, for instance, is compiled without ASLR, uh, without Fortify uh, hardening and things like this. But what we're really gonna look at is like finding uh, proper vulnerabilities from this binary without using source code. One which looks pretty cool is um, uh, the one with FOPEN right here, which is opening, um, I mean, it seems like it's opening um, a file with a predictable name in write mode in slash TMP. Uh, since this thing is running as root, there might be, you know, um, possibility for a symlink attack and basically a local privilege escalation. The thing which is interesting here is that we don't have a full backtrace. So the way the tool works internally is like, it does like, you know, decompilation, I mean, disassembly, decompilation, full static analysis on the binary um, uh, by using uh, symbolic execution. We wrote the engine ourselves, so it does it straight on binary. And a problem you commonly face when you use advanced techniques like this is that you don't have a full stack trace. So I have only a partial stack trace here, and I'd like to verify this vulnerability does exist. Okay, another way to do this is uh, to hit this problem is when you do fuzzing, like often, like in this case, th this is taken from the, um, the bugzilla of uh, Red Hat. It's also SMB, which, is, which seems to be crashing. And we have only a partial stack trace. And this thing is actually bizarre, right? Because it, it's not called from main. So we don't really know what's happening. What I know is that I don't want to call the whole thing from remote by sending packets. I'd like to verify the vulnerability exists by calling directly an arbitrary function inside the binary or inside a shared library. So that's our problem statement today. I want to be able to call any function inside any binary without having to craft an input to reach it and without necessarily going through main and whatever layer of function and then reach it. I want to be able to call those functions directly. Okay, so here are the components of the witchcraft compiler. Um, it has a, um, a linker, uh, which is a, a badass tool, which patches one byte in binaries, but its power is incredible. You're gonna see this. We got the uh, WCC, which is the core compiler, which is the tool which takes a binary as an input and gives you relocatable files that you can later on relink to generate new shared libraries or, or relink against your own code and like uh, get new executables. And finally, we have uh, the Witchcraft shell, which is by far the most complex. It's a, a full dynamic interpreter and scripting engine uh, built on top of Lua. And uh, yeah, we're gonna see that this is pretty cool. Um, with this shell, you can write your own scripts. So an example of scripts we're gonna see today are WCCH and WLDD. Let's go to the meat, libification. So if you did one class of computer science and C programming, the first thing people tell you is that what we're gonna do today is impossible. Let's start with the demo. I don't see anything. Yeah, yeah, I know you're not seeing this. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so for instance, um, to give you an idea of where, where is the state of the art of decompilation and why we're not gonna take this route. So this is a elo.c file, okay. 
And I'm going to show you the equivalent code generated by uh, possibly the best decompiler you can get for free. It's called Snowman. It works in two modes, either on top of IDAR, or it has a mode where it can run by itself uh, autonomously, which is free. So to give you an idea, like when you um, decompile these two lines of code program with uh, snow, uh, Snowman, you get something like this. Okay, so that's the source code which is supposedly equivalent. So if you take that path to decompile a real binary, let's take ProFTPD for instance. It's 200,000 lines of code. Okay, you're gonna get about 200,000 times this. So decompiling this and recompiling this is not reasonable. Uh, if, we, if we give it a try, just for fun, let's try to recompile the one from Snowman. I'm just gonna uh, grab the errors. Maybe, I don't see shit. Okay, let, let's, let's drop this. I think you got the idea. Okay, so what's libification? Uh, basically, we're gonna take an ELF file. This is the main header, um, uh, the ELF header. We're gonna patch one byte. We're gonna tell it, you're not a, you're not a binary, uh, you're not an executable binary anymore. Uh, you're a shared library. So patch it from ET exec to ET din. So let's do it with ProFTPD, for instance. Let me get this full size. Can you guys see any of this? That flies? Yeah? Okay, so uh, as an example, let's take ProFTPD. And let's assume we don't have the source code. Let's copy it to slash TMP. If we check the, the type of the file, um, okay, it's obviously an ELF executable, as seen right here. I'm gonna use uh, WLD, so the first tool from the Witchcraft Compiler Collection. It takes only one option, which is Libify, and then the name of the binary. So I'm gonna run this, and let, let's now check the type of this file. Okay, and surprisingly, it's a shared object, okay. But what's crazy now is that it really is a non-relocatable shared library that, can can that I can relink against my own applications. So let's check how to do this. Okay, so that's a sample program which is gonna load uh, slash tmp proftpd.so into memory. So let's start with renaming uh, ProFTPD we just patched into ProFTPD.so. It's gonna DL open it, so load it in memory, which returns a handle which allows you to call dmsim and find the address in memory of any of the symbols in there. What I'd really like to call is this function called PR underscore version underscore get underscore string, which returns inside ProFTPD the version of ProFTPD. So what's very crazy, let me show you the, the make file quickly. There's nothing very crazy. Okay, we're just using a link script to avoid GCC giving by default the same address to this program and to proftpd.so so they do not collide in memory. So what I do is basically my demo is mapped much lower, in, uh, much higher in memory to make space for this uh, non-relocatable shared library. And what's very crazy, is that this thing actually works. Okay. So if you look up there, it, it really returned like 1.3.3D, which incidentally is the version from ProFTPD, which we got from the shared library. Isn't this insane? Okay. Um, so that's exactly what we just did. You can see that we really just patched one, one byte in memory. <coughs> so without going into, you know, the crazy details, uh, there's a couple of reasons why this works. The first reason is that, um, oh, and I need to show you something else, which is very crazy, is that the, the library we just patched is still a valid executable. Th that is completely unexpected, right? So the reason that this works, 
the reason is still a valid executable is that basically the way we we uh, pushed full ASLR in the Linux kernel is by allowing you to compile your binaries as a shared library and execute at any execute them at any address in memory. Um, so yeah, you can have you can have a binary with technically a shared library. We're going to see that a bit more on this later. Um, the other thing which is a bit crazy is that this newly recrafted like shared library cannot be remapped in memory, right? Because it was never meant to be relocated that way. So we have a shared library, but that can only be mapped at a single address in memory. Um, this actually does exist in the normal world. Uh, it's called prelinking. It's the fact of giving a base address to speed up booting, essentially, um, to shared libraries. And uh, yeah, so that's exactly what's happening in here. Okay, let's do a demo with uh, Apache. I'm gonna s show you that um, you can actually relink against Apache, which is not a shared library, but pretend it's a shared library. Okay, so uh, let's look quickly at uh, the source code. Okay, so it does nothing crazy. It tries to call ap get server banner, which is a function which is defined inside Apache. And to do this, we're gonna link straight away against Apache as if it was a shared library. So let's type make quickly. Okay, it's complaining, boom. And if now I run this application, it's very crazy, but that also works. So Apache is not really a shared library, right? It's an executable, but it's compiled as etdin to have like full uh, ASLR. And uh, if you link directly against it, you can actually call functions directly inside it. This is so amazing that I'm tempted to end my talk here. Okay, if you look at like the way, um, you know, if, if, if you try to print like which shared libraries uh, this recursively, this application is linked with, you see that the first one is very much Apache. <laughs> that looks very crazy, but it works. Okay, let's go one step further. Uh, so this, uh, this technique we just used is by far my favorite because it's cross-platform. It works across architecture and it's super stable. There's no such thing as like complicated analysis that might fail and stuff like that. Like all we did was patching one byte, which you know, <laughs> incidentally is pretty reliable. If you wanted to go one step further and instead of transforming an executable into a shared library, go back to the uh, output of a compiler before the, the, the application is linked. So we'll call this uh, unlinking. Um, well, we're going to use this tool called WCC, which is a lot more complex and less portable. And you know, basically, what it tries to do is recreate the relocations um, uh, that were missing from the final executable, and add them to the the, um, the binary so that you can relink it. So the normal way to um, to do reverse engineering and to solve this problem would have been this: um, when you have uh, compiled source code, you would use a decompiler, which is totally not what we're going to do. We're just going to go to back to the relocatable files, and once I have the relocatable files, I'll be able to relink them again. So the command line is made so that there is zero learning curve. If you know to use GCC, it takes essentially the same parameters as GCC, only it doesn't take source code as an input. It takes a binary. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to give you a demo on this. Okay. So I have a, a small file here, which is a small C file, and it has a whole bunch of relocations. Okay, it has a number of imports. Um, it has strings which are in the read-only read data section. It has strings which are, you know, passed uh, as arguments. Um, so yeah, it has it has pretty much all the type of relocation that do exist. I'll, I'll you know, I'll share I'll share the source code so you guys um, can verify this. But essentially, what we're going to do is first compile it. 
then uh, so the, the normal compilation will give us a binary called small. Then we'll use the Wishcraft compi uh, compiler to go back to a relocatable file from this final binary, and we relink it as another binary using GCC called small2. And the question is like, does small2 actually runs? Because that would be very crazy. So let's compile it quickly. So if I run small, which is the original binary, it tells me something like hello from DEF CON. You can see that WCC, so let's redo this manually actually. Let me re-delete re re this and this. Okay, so I start, I have only this small binary. I'm gonna use WCC, the tool I just told you about. If I, if I play it stupid and I, I assume, I want, uh, you know, if I wanted to use GCC, so I would like to do something like this essentially. Uh, and tell it, give me, um, you know, small wcc.o, and I'd like it to be a relocatable file. If you run this, like GCC is gonna be like, I don't understand what you're trying to do. The input is not a source, is not a, a um, source code. But if you do it with WCC, it's gonna be like, yeah, okay, let's do this. And it gives you this relocatable file that then you can absolutely relink into small2. And what's amazing is that small2 does the same thing as the original binary. <laughs> this sounds very crazy, doesn't it? <laughs> so if you like it, uh, I'd really like you to contribute back to this tool and extend it. For the time being, it works mostly uh, on uh, AMD64. I'm trying to port it on ARM. And the drawback, as opposed to the first tool, which you know worked everywhere because we were just patching one binary, here it's a, it's a bit of work because we have to deal with all the type of relocations for all the type of CPUs. So I need your help with this. Okay, uh, I'd like to explain you one thing. Um, I choose, so to architecture this, uh, the front end is basically libbfd, so it's like obj dump and tools like this, so obj copy. Uh, which has a nice, I mean, the drawback is that it's not very precise, uh, but the advantage is that it works with many types of binaries, not just ELF files. So technically at this stage, we can try to do th very crazy things, like, <laughs> let's do witchcraft, baby. Let's try to transform a PE file into an ELF file. I'm running late, so uh, I'll let you play with this at home, but that basically works. We have one problem here, it's like, I don't know what to, what to relink this with, right? Um, so an idea would be to use like the libraries um, shipped with Wine, which already give us, uh, you know, the Windows API compiled as an ELF file. This is left as an exercise to the reader. We're gonna do something way more crazy right now. Can you run OpenBSD binaries let natively on Linux? I mean, if you've been to, you know, if you've done a bit of engineering, like that's not supposed to be possible. Like technically, you're supposed to have a virtual machine. Let's do it without a virtual machine. Proper witchcraft. <laughs> okay, so we could do this uh, manually. I'm, I'm gonna do it with a make file. Um, so the original binary, yeah, so here the, the original binary we're going to play with. Uh, you can see that it's very much an open BSD binary, okay. The source code is trivial, it's basically this, so it's, it's doing a bunch of printf in a row. Okay, here comes the main file. Uh, fuck the display today, okay. So we're gonna copy the binary, blah, blah, blah. Okay, basically there's a couple problems. The, um, the dynamic linker is expecting to find does not exist. So to show you manually, if I do like a um, S-trace, on this particular binary. Uh, 
that was not supposed to work actually because uh, I already patched it. Okay. <laughs> um, fuck. Okay, let's just run it. I'll explain you how it works later. <laughs> so basically, the dynamic linker is not the right one. This is hard coded inside the binary, inside the interpreter section. I could patch the binary to put my own dynamic linker. Instead, what I'm going to do is copy my real dynamic linker to the location is expecting the dynamic linker to be encountered. Okay. Right. Uh, so then it has a little bit of a problem. It's looking for libc, which is called libc.so.62.something. And my libc is not called like this. So I could patch the binary there again to, to tell him, like, no, look at like the libc I've got. But instead of this, I could also copy the uh, my own libc to the libc he's expecting. And if you do all that, I share all the, the, the material so you can reproduce yourself. But essentially, oh, amazing. <laughs> okay, if you, uh, there's an, a last problem. It's like it has a missing dependency on, um, right, if I try to run it now, uh, it has a missing dependency on at exit. So what we're going to do is use uh, LD preload to uh, give him a, um, you know, a shared library with all the dependencies is missing, like at exit. We don't really care, right? At exit is a function which is called, basically, when you exit, um, uh, to call um, you know, deconstructors and things like this. So I don't really care. Long story short, if you look at the last line, you do the LD preload, you run this open BSD binary, which has been slightly adapted inside um, um, a Linux machine, and it does print what it was supposed to print, which is also very crazy because there's no virtual machine and this was never supposed to work. Okay, now let's go to proper witchcraft uh, and I'm gonna introduce you to a programming language that comes from basically um, allowing, uh, I mean, uh, implementing a sort of reflection in C inside the Lua interpreter. So what I'd like to do is basically to get um, reflection-like features, but on binaries. Reflection is typically something which only exists on a virtual machine, right? It allows you to load um, classes or binaries in memory and instrument them, like get a, get a bunch of information on them, like what are, you know, um, um, what type of argument they're expecting and things like this, and then to invoke them directly in memory. So I'd like to do that, but without a virtual machine, straight from binary. Um, so it's based on dlopen, uh, which is the function we used earlier uh, to link with PoFTPD. You can, you can compile it with Luajit, which gives you a just-in-time compilation in memory. There's no ptrace, and it typically doesn't work like any um, you know, debugger you might have used before. I don't see the slides, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go quickly on this. Uh, and we're going to stick to the demos. Ten minutes? Okay. So it's time to activate. Okay. Since I don't see the slides, I'm, I'm just going to run it for you. Um, uh, okay. Oh. Okay, that's the SMB server I, g I showed you earlier with the static analysis thing. So let's, let's, talk, let's copy the SMB. It's already there. Fuck that shit. Okay, nothing works. So <laughs> I'm going to load like the ProFTPD binary we've uh, patched before, and I'm going to um, you know, showcase you the capabilities of WSH. So we just loaded it in memory. Um, it has a bunch of built-in functions. When you don't know one of the functions, you can use, um, you know, the help, which is uh, the only documentation you'll get <laughs> in this respect. Okay, so um, let's call this function, for instance. Hey, everybody. Is Jonathan doing a good job? Thank you, my brother. 
Thank you, folks. Okay, I really want to show you this because it's 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 beautiful. So we can do crazy things like uh, print the section headers that the output you would get from uh, NM typically. Only this is dynamic and this is recursive over all the shared libraries inside your memory. This is a feature I always wanted because it's not built in GDB and it's always a problem when you're trying to do this. Uh, you can have the program headers. You can look at like what are all the functions which are loaded right now in memory. Uh, let me show you this first. You can, you can ask him to print what are all the, the libraries that you have loaded in memory. I just loaded pre-FTP, but that also loaded all its dependencies. So if we look at like all the functions that this has actually loaded in memory, there's a fair bit of them in a bunch of you know, libraries, and we can now invoke them straight away. So already we got like 6,000 functions to play with in memory. I don't even know the prototype. I know nothing about them. So let's look, for instance, if there is a function uh, which print the version or something like this inside ProFTPD. Uh, OK, so uh, like before, we find this version called PR underscore version underscore get underscore number. I'm going to print this inside um, a variable, and if I print the variable like before, ah, that's not what I expected, because ah, that's not the right one. Let's try with the string one. Yeah, so like before, that's printing me internally the version number. <laughs> no, 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 you've seen nothing. The real good thing. The real good thing is, um, uh, so the real bad thing and why I took Lua, I, I, I'm going to try to activate, is that you can have more than one return value. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell him, OK, I want A, the result of this function, but also give me a context. And now if I looked at the context, it tells me a whole bunch of things is down, um, I mean, of the context of this execution. So that this L number, you know, was zero. There's no sec fault and stuff like that. I had not planned to do this, but let's do something crazy. Um, I mean, this allows you basically <laughs> to build static analysis uh, on top of uh, WSH very simply. I won't have the time to explain everything today. Uh, let's just say we want to test all the functions inside ProFTPD. I'd like you to fuzz them and call them a hundred times each. So it's going to list all the functions in memory. And what it's doing right now is like calling them. OK. OK, let's stop this for a sec. <laughs> Dear God, I've been too ambitious. OK. <laughs> a hundred times is too much. Let's run it like once. And what happens is that is recording all this stuff in memory, and you can see them uh, right after. OK, I don't have the time to see you all this. I don't want to sabotage this talk, but uh, that's too bad. We're lacking time. Invite me to your local conference. Uh, yeah, I won't talk about this. I won't talk about this. Future work. What I'd like you to help me with. Yeah, I know. We were super late. <coughs> Uh, so I think this is a, a very cool base to do reverse engineering. There's a whole bunch of stuff I don't have the time to do. So uh, if you would like to participate, uh, get in touch. Do you have any questions or do you want me to stick to demos? Oh, there is one thing I need to show you because it's amazing. Uh, what if I wanted to analyze an ARM binary on my Linux machine? So typically to do this, uh, there again, you would need like a uh, you know, a full hypervisor and things like this. What I did is just uh, cross-compile my WSH shell to WSH ARM. Okay. I've registered QMU in a weird mode um, to do me, when I execute natively, an uh, ARM binary on my machine. Um, In-memory binary translation. So this is really an ARM binary I'm running on my own machine right now. And what we're going to do with this is load this libsl Linux thing, which comes from ARM. 
So it's complaining because some dependencies are missing. Typically, you would do this inside a ch root to have all the dependencies. But you can see that, like before, we have a bunch of functions and we can call them directly. Now, let me show you something which is really insane. Uh, for instance, <coughs> okay, let's print, let me get my PID. So that's my PID, and it didn't work. That's amazing. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's get it another way. I cannot get a shell, that's beautiful. Fuck. Okay, uh, I can have it another way. Um, let's just look at like the libraries mapped inside memory. So my process is really a ARM process. It's loading a ARM binary and it's running natively on Linux. The binary translation is also inside the same process, thanks to QMU and uh, the weird mode it's using. And it's all, it, all of this is just one program in memory. You don't need a virtual machine, you don't need all that garbage. And that facilitates a lot, like, you know, the fact of sharing this tool uh, or, or having like an ARM binary and calling functions inside it uh, from other application without any reverse engineering. Last but not least, I'm almost done. <laughs> Uh, I told you SMB server, I wanted to write an exploit for it, so let's do that quickly. We saw before that uh, we wanted basically to call this particular function called reply close inside uh, SMB server. Do we have the binary here? Okay. So let's do WSH of SMB server. If I want to call reply close directly, I can. This sex fault, by the way, this is amazing. Um, uh, we get to know that it writes, but we didn't decompile. We didn't ptrace. We get that basically by writing a custom signal handler and passing better, like, you know, the output we can get out of it. Let's give it a couple arguments and let's see why it's crashing. Okay. So right here it's crashing because basically the second argument, as you can see, is trying to write. So let's map something here. Okay, in Lua, strings are supposed to be immutable, but in PubC, which is, you know, what's happening in this script, you can break all the Lua rules. In particular, yeah, you can absolutely write to, to strings. So I'm gonna try to this string. It did reply close, okay? And if you remember like the static analysis we saw, uh, this is supposedly creating a file in slash tmp with a predictable name which is g something. And you can see here that yeah, this file was actually created. And what's amazing here is that we can verify results of static analysis without any reverse engineering basically, and we can call any function we like in the stack trace, even if we, have, we don't have the full stack trace, and even if we don't know an input to take us there. With this, my friends, I think I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention today. Yeah.